Hey, what's going on, AP World? We have Chapter 11 of Alan Brinkley's American History for you today, titled Cotton Slavery in the Old South. So let's get going. We're going to talk about the cotton economy, and in, in, in particular, why was cotton so popular? Well, tobacco exhausted land. If you think back to colonial times, tobacco exhausted land, and it was it fluctuated a lot in price, especially in the the early to mid 19th century. Sugar and rice cultivation was incredibly arduous and difficult. It was very time consuming and very, very hard work. And the Industrial Revolution, which is happening in the early to mid 19th century, created a new large demand for cotton to be used in textile factories up north. So we have the spread of cotton and plantations. By 1850, cotton became the dominant cash crop of the South. And the Deep South saw most of this production. And when we're talking about the Deep South, we're talking about these states in red here, and in particular the really dark red here. Um, these states will see the largest amount of slaves and also the most production of cotton. Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, etc. And the southern industry was mostly agriculture. And some commerce developed, but as Alan Brinkley says, it served really the plantation economy. So any any commerce or industry that developed really developed around to serving the rich plantation owners in the plantation economy. So why did the South not industrially develop? Why did the North get all the industry? Well, there was lots of money to be made in agriculture, and the climate and terrain was very favorable to farming. And uh, many Southerners had capital that was tied up in farming through the through slaves and machines as well. There was also a lack of adequate infrastructure. You didn't see a lot of railroads, canals, roads, highways, etc. that were being built in the South. We have a guy by the name of James B. DeBeau, and he warned of the dependence on the North. He, he wrote often about how the, the South was too economically dependent on the North, and he called for and favored in econ the economic independence for the South. He wanted to see the South be less dependent on the North. So we're going to talk about white society in the South, and when we talk about the South and slavery, it's important to note that one out of every four whites owned slaves, and, and an even smaller portion owned plantations. So out of the one out of four whites that owned slaves, most of them really owned one or two slaves at most. It was a very small percentage that actually owned plantations with more than one or two slaves. Those that did had tremendous power and influence in their communities. And a social theorist in the South who, who was a very prominent writer was, was a guy by the name of George Fitzhugh. And he was a Southern writer and he defended slavery and also the subordination of women. He advocated for slavery, he defended it, and he was one of the leading people to speak out on behalf of slavery. Women, just like African Americans living in the South, had very few opportunities at education, and many people did in general, as we'll see. And those women that did receive education or did have opportunities for education really just focused on being good wives. There would be schools that were set up to teach women how to be wives. Okay, we're going to talk about the plain folk, and these were individuals in the South who were mostly subsistence farming, and if they had any extra land or that they could, they would do some cash crop farming, but most of it was subsistence, meaning they were growing enough just to live off of themselves. There were very few educational opportunities in the rural South, and think again, the reason why is it's so spread out. Transportation is not able to unite a lot of these people, certainly on a daily basis. We're going to talk about the hill people, and these are people that lived in the Appalachian Mountain region, especially what becomes West Virginia. Prior to the Civil War, West Virginia was a part of Virginia, so this group right in here is going to be the hill people that the book refers to. And they opposed the planter elite. And as the, the country gets closer to secession in the Civil War, this area in particular is going to resist secession leading up to the Civil War. And during the Civil War, West Virginia will be created and will be a Union state, not a Confederate state. So let's talk about why were plantation owners so influential, especially if they were so few in number. Well, because they had money, they controlled markets, credit, and machines, and many people were dependent on them for these goods. And also, they often had many relatives in town. It was not uncommon for a large plantation owner to have many different relatives scattered throughout the small rural towns. Okay, the South called slavery the, the peculiar institution, and in the mid-19th century, in the mid-1800s, slavery was illegal everywhere in the Western world except for the U.S., Brazil, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. 
Slave codes were instituted in the South to help regulate the behavior of slaves, and they included things like not slaves could not own property, they could not be out after dark, they could not strike a white person under any reason, even if it was for self-defense, they could not receive an education, they could not learn to read or write, they could not be married, they were incredibly, incredibly harsh laws governing slaves. And punishments varied, but some punishments were as severe as this. This is um, a, a very famous picture taken during this time, and you can see on this gentleman's back he has scars from being whipped. Overseers on plantations were those that were in charge of slaves in the fields, and they were often harsh and brutal towards slaves. They did not usually own the slaves, so it was their job to make sure that the slaves worked as hard as possible and as much as possible, and they often were very brutal to slaves. Slave life. Living condition, conditions were incredibly harsh. Um, women often worked in the fields with men during the day, and then at night they would go home and do housework. They would clean, they would cook. So female slaves often had it harder than men. House slaves may have had less physical work, but they lived in closer proximity to owners, and this often led to more punishments for them since, since the owners were around them more often. They were often isolated from other slaves, and female house slaves were subject to harsh treatment from owners and white women as well, particularly wives of owners who would be jealous of the relationship that some slave owners would have with female slaves. Slaves in cities were few and far between. They were certainly fewer than in rural areas, and the reason for this is there is a fear of, in, in, of insurrections in cities. We're going to talk about the slave trade now. Now, keep in mind the international slave trade was outlawed in 1808. That means that slaves could no longer be imported from foreign countries, but that did not mean that slaves were not bought and sold. In fact, the domestic slave trade continued. This was an incredibly humiliating experience for these African Americans. One of the saddest things that came about of the domestic slave trade was the fact that many families were broken up. Mothers and fathers would be separated from their children, who would be separated from their siblings, and, and it was not uncommon to see families broken up. In the late 1830s, we had a, a ship, the Amistad, and slaves revolted aboard this ship in Cuba. And they tried to sail the ship back to Africa, but they ended up being caught off the coast of the United States. And John Quincy Ar Adams argues that the slaves should be freed. He goes all the way to the Supreme Court. An event in the Supreme Court eventually agrees with him, and the former slaves were returned to Africa. So let's talk about resisting slavery. This absolutely did happen, and it took on many different forms. Probably the most common form took place was passive resistance, and this included working slowly, faking illness, running away, breaking or sabotaging tools discreetly. Those were mo most common, and although slave revolts did happen, they were in fact very rare, especially when you compare it to passive resistance. A couple rebellions you should be f familiar with. We have Gabriel Proser in 1800. Um, this rebellion was stopped before it occurred, and Proser and 35 others were hanged. In 1822, Denmark Vesey and his followers planned a rebellion, but just like Gabriel Proser's rebellion, word leaked out before it actually happened. In 1831, we have Nat Turner's Rebellion, which happens in Virginia. It is an armed revolt of slaves, and they, the slaves go throughout Virginia and kill 60 white people, including men, women, and children. And if we look at this picture here, it depicts the slaves as these brutal people who are just killing these innocent white people, as you can see here. And this was, this was an engraving that was used as propaganda to help lead to a restriction of African American rights. And this is a key theme you'll see. Every time there is a rebellion, whether it actually happens or not, the South is going to clamp down even more on slaves. They're going to treat them much harsher than before. All right, we're going to talk about the culture of slavery. In a unique language that combined English and African language developed among African Americans. Music played a large role in daily life. Um, it was a way to communicate, and it also helped pass time in the fields while slaves were working. Religion played just as important role in their lives, and virtually all slaves were Christian by the 1800s. African American religion was often emotional, and often talked about being delivered to freedom. Let's jump ahead and talk about slave family life. Now, slaves could not legally marry. However, um, slaves would often have their own ceremonies that were not legally recognized. As I mentioned earlier about families being broken up, one-third of all families were broken up due to the slave trade, and it was not uncommon to see 
for a slave to see up to a dozen family members be bought and sold over the course of their life. And a frequent cause of running away for slaves was to simply be re reunited with family members that were sold to other plantations. Okay, there's chapter 11 for you of the American History Textbook. If you have not, please take a moment and subscribe to my channel. If you found this video helpful, please press the like button and also share this on Twitter or Facebook or any other social media outlet. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I really appreciate you guys watching. Thank you very much and have a good day, guys.